Make sure we're in gallery view. Beautiful. And then let's start recording. All right. I think I've done it in all three places. Zach Nugent, finally, after many tries. <laughs> finally, that was a pain in the ass, man. Oh, my gosh. For those who don't know, uh, Zach was, we were having some internet issues, and there's almost nothing you can do when you're having internet connectivity issues. I'm going to go on a shopping spree and buy a whole new router. So. Yeah. Look, and, let's go now. New toys as well. I heard you got a drum kit. Oh, Lord. Well, I'm setting up this space. It's like um, studio space and uh, rehearsal and streaming space since winter is hitting hard on the Northeast yeah. right now. And yeah. uh, and who knows what 2021 is going to look like. You know, to, to build a tour, you need at least like six months. To, and that's like to rush a tour concrete you know? planning like knowing that things can happen yeah yeah so it's not like say they open the floodgates on september 9th 2021 and we're all vaccinated and everything's good it's not like we can just start touring it's six like months out from there, there you're gonna have to figure out what venues are open and, and totally yeah that's i can't even imagine the commitment that would go into planning something it's crazy like that. yeah so it's gonna be a minute so anyway i'm setting up the space i want to be able to do full band streams um awesome yep so yeah, I found a drum kit yesterday that I couldn't couldn't help myself, and I uh, made it happen. <laughs> That's perfect, man. You are uh, you're. I I feel like I should give some kind of introduction, but I think most people who will be watching this will absolutely know who you are. But um, I would love to to ask some questions later on about this transition into like a, a post COVID world for a musician sure. and what that looks like because you're doing some really cool stuff. But I would love to hear your story about how you got into this. Uh, kind of from day one, whether it was just dead music or playing music and, and how that's taken you to where you are now. Yeah, sure. So uh, I grew up in Connecticut until I was about mm, 10 years old. And I've been in Vermont ever since. Um, and my parents are big into music. They're huge music people. They're not musicians themselves, but there's always music playing in the house. They're always going to see live music. Um, they're always exploring new music and finding new cool stuff. So Growing up, I was always exposed to every kind of music you can imagine. They're huge deadheads, um, but they're also way big into classical and reggae and um, like world music and cool. bluegrass, everything. So I heard all sorts of stuff. I was exposed to everything. It's not like my parents are like just these hippie deadheads and like I grew up as like a flower child yeah. and yeah. Had Jerry everywhere. <laughs> this is my I music. had everything. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had access to everything, and it was the Grateful Dead and Jerry that stuck for me. So awesome. um, that, you know, uh, again, it wasn't like it was pushed on me, and this is like the world I grew up in. It, it, it meant something to me from a really early age. I, I singled that out, and was like, oh, that's, that's, what I, that's music to me. That's awesome. And so when I was a kid in school and middle school and whatever, I played um, violin and clarinet and piano, and... Uh, and none of those things stuck. I mean, I played a little bit in like the band recitals and whatever, and um, I can play, I can noodle a little bit of piano now, but nothing that anyone would want to hear. <laughs> uh, but I grabbed a guitar when I was 12 years old. There was a shop in Hanover, New Hampshire that rented guitars. And so um, it was like 19 bucks a month or something. Oh yeah. So yeah, so you know, for a while I'd been like, get me a guitar, get me a guitar. And my parents were like, you drop three instruments. We're not gonna spend 400 bucks <laughs> on a guitar or whatever yeah. for you. And They're not convinced or uh, sold yet. They weren't convinced, but then, you know, the guitar was 20 bucks a month, so whatever. Yeah. They were like, sure, we can definitely do that. So I left with the guitar that day and went home. I was 12 and went home and learned to play Ripple in my living room. How that, was, cool. that was the first thing I learned. And, uh, and that was that. I, um, when I thought about music or thought about guitar, I picked up a guitar, I thought about Jerry and the Grateful Dead. Um, and, you know, it, for a long time, it was that I wanted to, like, play just like that. And I wanted to play those solos and learn those riffs and whatever. And so now that's, like, a key part of what I do, for sure. Like, people expect to hear the Jerry thing out of me. Yeah. Although a lot of people don't know that I play other stuff. Like, someone will hire me for, like, a wedding gig or, like, for an original gig. And they'll be like, whoa, I didn't know you played, like, that stuff. I'm like, yeah, I'm not, like, yeah, I know how to play the guitar. one dimension here. <laughs> right. So it's, it's what I love. It's my bread and butter, for sure. Um, awesome. And it's what people know me for. But so I, at first I set out to like learn the riffs and play just like that. And eventually um, I just realized how much, what a fun style it is and what a fun styling Jerry built on the guitar. So true. And it's like every night, it's the most cliche thing, but every night is different. And uh, like no, no song ever turns out the same way twice. And it's so much fun to explore this stuff and, so, and cool. so much freedom and what a beautiful canvas to, to paint on. 
did you find you had a um because this is the early two you said you were born in 88 i think yes when we talked yesterday december so. of 88 so you know, almost 89 yeah, yeah, but okay yeah. so this is like 2000 sort of turn of the century that you're yeah. really falling in love five years after jerry died that's yeah. uh what eras did you find yourself listening to or drawn to initially I've always, from day one, and it's still this way, I'm like unpopular opinion, and I go through these of all different kinds of phases, but I'm like an 88, 89 dude. That's me. <laughs> you too? That's me all the time, every day. Dude, the tones and yeah. like, I don't, and like late 89, spring 90, they were like, they had rehearsed again and they were like playing like they had something to prove. Oh it was God. good. It was awesome. There's something huge to be said for like all of the 70s. 72 is like such fire and 73, yep. 74, like, gets so sweet they got the wall sound they're like really starting to like dial in and like figure out what yeah. music and really ba band is. chemistry is just is yeah. beautiful i got goosebumps my hair's hey, no, say, say, <laughs> that's cool man uh, and then by like you know 77 78 <clears throat> it's so like fluid and slinky and groovy and they found a thing yep um and i love that it's not that i don't like the 70s everyone's always like what you're not like you don't love the 70s i'm like well no i do but well, like hold on <laughs> yeah hold on just like by 88 89 90 when they still had brent yep um Same. who Again, I get into such big arguments about this, but Brent was like key member of the band. I think the same thing. He, his voice was the first voice oh. I ever heard. My dad played "I Will Take You Home" for me on the way way home from the hospital. So I just have like this almost. It feels yeah. like a karmic duty to just like love Brent <laughs> in the band. Totally, man. And he's his, yeah, his vocals, the energy he brought to the band, and he's one of the best B three players. He shared it from a guy who's been on the road for four years with like the best B three player. Yeah, and is like the one he's the guy let's talk about b3 because that's a sound that like almost can i don't want to say it divides deadheads but some people aren't sure. the biggest fan of an organ and for me like i could have an organ sitting by my left or right ear all day sure. yeah take full. the piano take the piano home get out of here yeah no it's I, I love e piano i love you know piano's great and stuff i think it's awesome but yeah I, i'm such a sucker for organ so how me did too. that love come about just the the love of the 80s and that sound it being there i think so and i've always been like since i was a little kid and realized what the grateful dead was and and ventured into that world and like checked out that whole family and that community and that scene i quickly discovered jerry garcia band and so jgb was a favorite band of mine for a long 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 time it also <laughs> could be like a past life thing like every yeah. time i sang when i first sang with the jgb girls they were like yeah. Where, are you a southern boy? You like got a gospel thing? And I'm always like, no, I'm like a, a white kid from Vermont. <laughs> um, and so I don't know where it came from. I'm not saying I have it, but I hear so many people say that about like my vocal styling and my yeah. music. Interesting. Uh, yeah. And so it's like, uh, I don't know what I read into or what I subscribe to, but it could be like a past life. That thing. past life came from Alabama or something. Yeah. That, that like <laughs> that like church feel and the B3 means so much to me. That's awesome. I love, I love the piano. That. I love Melvin's piano playing. I love Brent's piano playing. I think Keith did, had a lot of great moments. Yeah. It's not that I like don't like piano, but if I had yeah. to pick one, B3 all day. Same. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. So your JGB listening starts coming in around where in relationship to Grateful Dead love? Um, I think I was, I mean, I have like in like some scrapbook, I have a, a card from when I graduated from second grade. That was that's like dancing bears on a bridge, and some was <laughs> from like a family friend that was like congratulations, or whatever. So I was like getting Grateful Dead themed stuff as like a seven year old, <clears throat> and I think it was probably by the time I was like nine, eight or nine, that I had realized like what was going on with JGB. Okay. I was like, oh, this is different, but the same, but crazy awesome. Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to put into words how like because it's the same spirit of music, but um. It's it's a different execution of it, I guess. And, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's just for for somebody that already likes that Grateful Dead sound, and yeah. you know that's my favorite stuff. I listen to JGB, and I'm like, why was it this it all the time? Like, well, with and like even with Jerry's guitar playing, and like the Dead, you've got like the country stuff. <laughs> but yep. in uh, in JGB, it's so like like don't let go. You know, there's nothing like, there's nothing in the dead music for me that like chugs quite like JGB does. Yeah, yes, exactly. You know I what I mean? I can't tell if it's a, if it's a, a one drummer thing or if it's a I John Kahn on bass thing and that, I feel like there's a lot going on with John and Jerry's playing 
yeah. being, and I don't know enough about bass to have studied John versus Phil, but to me, I hear John and I'm always thinking like tighter, funkier playing. Yeah, uh, totally. And Jerry and John Kahn were really, really, really close friends. Yeah. They were inseparable friends and they, you know, like Melvin would tell me stories about, they had so many jokes that like no one even understood. Like they would, uh, they would like take a set, they'd write out the set list mm -hmm. and they'd be like, all right, well, now let's move this song and play it upside down in the beginning instead of the end. And they'd be like cracking up, like crying, laughing. And Melvin and the girls would be like, what are these guys what talking this? about? <laughs> so like <clears throat> they were in a world of their own and they were like best buds through thick and thin and for better or for worse. Wow. Um, but you know, it's like the Grateful Dead is a weird thing. And there's a lot that like maybe people turn a blind eye to or don't really know about or don't really want to talk about or know about. Yeah. But they're like, it wasn't always, they weren't the best of buddies all the time. And I'm sometimes sure. in some yeah. cases they never were the best of buddies. You're touring and essentially living in some capacity with this larger number of people and you gotta it's not gonna work all the time in every direction so I can totally. imagine we're having a side project like JGB or something to kind of take off into if you're Jerry and you have this this train that you're sort of driving whether you want to be driving it or not like yeah I, for I sure it's, that's exactly what happened with the dead they like they, they gained su some success and they were writing by the time they like gained real traction in the 70s mm -hmm. they were writing crazy stuff like weather report sweet and like eyes of the world and they were like trying to make sense of these crazy beasts that they created yeah and uh all while all while running a huge production and jerry was taking on things like the grateful dead movie you know, um, and so they retired in 1974. Yeah. You know, they were like, this is a I had lot. to take a break. <laughs> right. And Jerry started JGB in 72 in some incarnation. You know, there was Legion of Mary and all that stuff. But it was like. I didn't realize it started that early. That's yeah. Cool. It was like the John Con, Jerry, Merle, whatever. The side group okay. started in 72. Cool. And, and it was uh, uh, it was Maria Moldar originally on. She came in a little later, like okay. late 70s. Okay. Um, gotcha. And yeah, yeah, with with Legion of Mary, there were female vocals. Uh, yeah, there were so many incarnations. But you know, Jerry and John, he John jumped on with with the early JGB and with Olden in the Way okay. in like '73, oh. and that was that. Like Jerry never did a project unless it was the Grateful Dead. He never did a project without John Con. John Con, that's great. So John Con was in, the, behind all the the dog stuff later on. The, Grisman collaborations. Do you know anything about that, or was he? Um, there, not all of them. Sometimes okay. Grisman brought, brought in an upright player, or okay. they would bring in someone who's a little more um, apt at playing upright. Khan yeah. sort of had his own thing going on, <laughs> which didn't necessarily work for absolutely everything. Yeah. <laughs> so if they were trying to nail like the uh, the straight up like bluegrass thing. I think they brought in someone who was a little more trained. But bluegrass. anything you know, they were taking on the road or any like projects or whatever. It was Khan. Um, That's cool. I've that seen somewhere where. He was responsible as well for kind of bringing a lot of that funk um, outside the dead repertoire to Jerry, at least with the yeah. trying to think of songs in my head. I can't think of specific well, examples. Well, Prudence, like Dear Prudence, I keep yeah, thinking of. Go. Jerry's just going... <laughs> All day, but Khan's going... Which is cool, which is so opposite of what Phil did. And I, you know, I played a bunch with Phil and I played with some great players who play like Phil. And there's nothing like playing with that. I can't even imagine. <laughs> it's really crazy. It's what ridiculous. Is, yeah. What is that? I mean, there's so many things. You've played with some um, incredible cats, undoubtedly. And uh, I don't want to just like, you know, fanboy too much. But what is that like? Like, how do you. Is, are you in your own head for a while? Like, holy shit, I'm playing with Phil Lesh, or holy shit, I'm playing with Melvin Seal. It's like I remember the first, yeah, okay, so when I first started with um, JGB, I remember the first time Melvin played with my band Cats Under the Stars, which was back in maybe like 2013 or 14, cool. the first time he sat in with us. And I remember I like couldn't wipe the smile <laughs> off my face while we were playing. I was like trying to sing, and I was smiling too hard to sing. It was crazy. I mean, it's so, like Melvin is a perfect B3 player. Um, so like even without the prestige and whatever, in my mind of who he was and what he'd done, if yeah. I'd never heard of the guy and you popped him on stage and he started playing like that, I was still going to be like, still Whoa. grinning. Ear yeah. To ear. 
So then, you know, to know that he's Melvin of JGB, Jerry's buddy, Jerry's yeah. keyboard player, 15 years, all that. And it's like, oh, God. So that smile lasted for a long time. Awesome. Um, I remember well into JGB, there'd be times where I'd be like, oh, okay, I have to sing right now. And I would, I would be so hard, smiling so hard that I honestly, like, couldn't pull it together to sing sometimes. That's awesome, though. Um, and it was so great. And that happened when I first started playing with Phil, too. I haven't played with Phil nearly as much as I played with Melvin. Um, I've got hundreds of shows under my belt with Melvin, maybe 400 or something like that, four or 500. And oh, uh, so, uh, you know, that became like, we became buddies. We became bandmates and it became more normal. But never, even to like the last show I played with Melvin last year or whatever, um, there was still always moments where I would just be like, oh, I'm at church right now. That's you so know? cool. I love that feeling. Or he'd do something on like a Gamora or some pretty song, and I'd just be like, "That is Melvin Seals." Takes you into outer space. Yeah, That's totally. So cool. Wow. So you you develop sort of a sense then, in some way that you can control, where it's like, "Okay, this is what this is what I'm doing. I'm here right yeah. now. I'm present." Totally. Um, okay. Yeah. Totally. I, feel- and I remember I've been playing the Grateful Dead stuff for so long, and with so many players, and like trying out different players, and trying to find guys who do the thing that I want to do. Yeah. Um, and I remember it sounds like such a, it sounds like a cartoon thought or something almost, but I remember the first time I was playing with Phil, I had like my eyes closed and, um, we were playing the first time I played with Phil, he sat in with JGB and we played like shakedown and sugary. And I think we started with shakedown and I remember in the shakedown jam when you're hanging on that C, um, I just, uh, I remember thinking to myself, like, my eyes closed, I was sort of lost, and I was like, man, this, this, the guy playing bass right now is really good. Like, I just had this, like, I, like, yeah. lost it for a second. I wasn't even thinking about where like, you are. This Phil guy, the guy pretending to be Phil right now is, like, really nailing it. <laughs> it was, like, a fleeting half-second thought, but I had it, and I was like, yep, it's Phil. That's for funny. Us. Dude, I mean, I've had that, that thought with, um, both you and and Josh Olkin before listening to you guys and forgetting I'm listening to oh, a, a cover thanks, band, man. you know, and and you embody that beautiful spirit. And thanks, I, dude. And I tune in. And I'm like, oh, who's? Wow, Jerry's on fire. Oh, it's Zach. Oh, that means <laughs> like, a lot, man. Thank it's, you. It's killer, man. And I I I admire that um that talent because it's a weird role to step into where you're like balancing a, a fine line between replication, but yeah. you know, being unique and being creative. What you said that you we're kind of shopping around trying to find the folks that do the dead music the way you want to do it. What does that look like in your mind? If you can articulate it? Yeah, totally. This is something that like, uh, is very dividing in my musical career. Some people are like, I'm never working with that dude again. (laughs) And I mean, people will tell you, I'm sure Dan told you in the interview, I can be like a, just a total brute and like a terror to work with. (laughs) Because I know what well, he I likes want. Frank Zappa, so then of course he's gonna work right. with you. <laughs> I know what I want, and I know it's yeah. out there. Yeah, and I've heard it before, and I've done it before. And when it doesn't happen, and I think it's like it can be happening, and it's laziness, or it's people like not playing their part enough, or like yeah. being present enough, I get pissed. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. I'm not. I'm not like shoving dudes down the stairs or being like go to hell. Get but I'm definitely here. for sure. But I'm you. Anyone who plays with me will tell you after a show, I will often be like, "Yo, what was that?" Gotcha. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, and it's little things like, and I noticed when playing with these guys, um, like when, when we played Shakedown with Phil, there's the, and Phil goes, yeah, you know, there's that bass line, um, and so, and there's a lot of dudes who'll do like, you know, or like, and it just like, doesn't hit in the parts. It doesn't hit, and I don't need anyone to play like specific parts all night long or like replicate the album. But, yeah. like, there's something that happens inside you when Jerry goes, and Phil goes, you know? It just, like, that's a thing. You're like, okay, I'm home. This is the beginning of the song. And so um, that's a great example. right now. That's cool. That's really cool. There's, like, a chart. There's, like, a chart running by in my head of, yeah. like, here's, here's the song, and here's the, like, these are the important things that absolutely have to happen to mark yeah. the way and to remind the listener that like they're in a safe and familiar place. Yes. And then do whatever else, whatever you want with all of it. Don't you don't have to replicate anything? You don't. It doesn't have to be like a perfect cover or a perfect tribute or whatever. But there mm-hmm. are like anchors and landmarks that we like. I feel that we owe it to the crowd and to these heads to like hit for them and remind them like everything's okay. We're taking care of this music. We're going to be careful with it. We're going to treat it the right way. And I promise we're going to give you what you need. 
that's really well said. That's Thanks. oh man, that's super cool. I have a lot to that are a lot of thoughts churning in my brain right now. Yeah, sure. Let's that go. resonates like uh yeah, just having a roadmap of the song, having a vocabulary in your soul to where you almost can't help but play those parts. And I'm I'm not really listening totally. for um I don't I don't play this music too much with a band, but my band will cover dead tunes occasionally and uh, and it's really fun because playing music without dead, er, like with um, non dead heads, is an experience, especially good musicians that aren't dead yeah, heads, where they like cool. they, they get it, but they're applying their own influences and I stuff love to that. it. So cool. That's a very fun experience. But also, um, yeah, I can, I can imagine where you're playing with somebody that like gets this music and executes it well. Part of that execution strategy is going to be remembering to hit when it hits, like whatever those little moments are and studying that. So, and that had a lot to do with me departing from JGB too. Interesting. Um, yeah, Melvin so when was that, that was about 2019 sometime. Yeah, was it was last, last year. It was about a year ago right now. I played my last show on Jerry's birthday, August 1st. Oh, wow. Cool. Um, and, uh, so Melvin had this idea that, well, it started when I started in JGB, um, we started changing a lot of tempos and a lot of feels, uh, you know, like How, the thing drastically that, or what? Pretty kind? drastically. The thing that comes to mind first, like everybody needs somebody. Okay. Um, Jerry, you know, the JGB was going. Everybody needs somebody. You know, and so um, it was like this, just big thunderous, and like Melvin was wailing, and the drums were like so much toms and. Yeah. Just like party song to end the night with and uh we started doing like a and it started it was like a chick boom it was like a blues brothers kind of thing i see i see and that was early on and melvin and i sort of got into it i, I had been in jgb for a few months when he changed that he would have these ideas like in bed or on the yeah. drive to the studio or whatever and he'd present them to us and be like all right here's how we're going to do this now <laughs> and jgb was very much like the melvin chip yeah. Yeah, you know exactly. like Here's his idea. The band is working for him. And that's fine. I yeah, get that exactly. way too. But so he would come into the studio or like off the tour bus with these ideas and be like, this is how we're playing. Everybody needs somebody now. And so pretty early on, we got into it over that song. And I was like, that's not, that doesn't sound good. And like, in my humble opinion, people are coming out to see something that they lost 25 years ago. Interesting. And they want to like feel it again. They don't want to come out and be like, this isn't how this used to go. Yeah. So I get that Melvin like has, you know, these things that he needs to work out or like he's been playing the songs for 40 years or whatever. And he is it's ready about to time for a change. Up. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I just, it just didn't feel right in JGB and I could almost like, I could see it on people's faces and interesting. Like we'd start playing these versions and I could see people being like, what? And I'd be like, Oh God, just like get me out of here. And so you, you, know? you did not, I, I see if your intention is to recreate sort of an experience or at least a sentiment in people, a sentiment. And, yeah. And you can see on their faces that that sentiment is not hitting or that it's confusion. Like they're trying to guess the song, but they don't know. Yeah. That would it cause this. Yeah. I, I get It's like when you're jamming to a song you love, it's an underground tune and nobody in the crowd, you know, you're at a bar or something and nobody's getting it. I totally it's a similar feeling of, and we started, we started JGB started adding in so many um, grateful dead songs. Okay. And how did that so, work? Was that? How did that work? I, that's a terrible way of asking it, but was it you <laughs> Not and very Mel? well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, we just started adding in like um, Shakedown and Scarlet. Just some and classic. Classics. <laughs> I'm like, yo, we have Melvin. Se you are Melvin Seals. Yeah. And we've got like the thing. We're playing the Warfield and the Cap and like. Who was singing? Was Jackie in fall or? Uh, Jackie and Glory would do certain shows with us. Okay. So that was um, done a bunch of shows with them, but Cheryl and Shirley had been cool. with JGB for, I think, 17 years. Oh, wow. And then they were let go in 2017. Okay. No, maybe 2018. Yeah, end of 2017. And then Sunshine and Chi. Sunshine and Chi. Cool. Sunshine uh, Garcia Becker from Further. Oh, wow. Nice. Um, and Lady Chi signed on. And Sunshine left shortly after I did. She only lasted a little over a year or so. Okay. It's a it's a, an experience being on the road with that band. It'll, I it'll can only imagine. some people alive. If you watch the turnover now, it's kind of crazy. 
Phew, yeah. Uh, that's- <laughs> so. So you had about a two. Uh, how how long is this? A little over three years. Three year run. Cool. That's something uh, like 1,200 hours, though, on stage playing music yeah, with those right. guys. That's crazy. Right. Yeah, we were doing like 120 shows a year on average. That's and dope. then Damn. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, we started playing a ton of Grateful Dead songs. And we were doing, like I said, we were doing like Uncle John's Band and Shakedown and Scarlet Fire. Yep. And, um, and we were doing all these like weird transitions, too. We were doing this transition that was like dancing in the streets into uh like the ending of terrapin into like the yeah. and what were we doing you know we were like oh. doing that right into dancing and there were some cool things but in like typical fashion of that band or that project they were it was the same every night yeah so like yeah. we'd get this one transition down like that. I can't even quite remember what. We and were that's doing. your transition for the tour, kind of. For yeah, for the year, and we would yeah. do like we would encore with that every night, okay. and so it was like, yeah. yo, it, you know, um, and also JGB was playing to a click track to keep the tempos the same every Interesting. night. Interesting. I was. We were all on in ear monitors, no no floor monitors allowed, okay. and we were playing to a click in our ear, which to me was just another thing where I was like, Jerry would be rolling in his grave. The, yeah, the click. This is all about reading the crowd and like playing to the energy of the room. Yep. And man, you could feel it like the friction being like, oh, the crowd's trying to go, and harder they come is just like, dun, 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 dun. And it's dun. like, oh no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the, uh, I get that there's so many good reasons to have a click, especially like if you got a nice, really slow tune and you're just sure. trying to just everybody stay locked in and it's 65 sure. BPM, that's great. But I, uh, I have always thought like, yeah, some songs are meant to have a little bit of extra energy some nights. For and sure. Like Shakedown. Shakedown's a weird one because I don't think I ever hear anybody play it to a tempo that's satisfactory to me. I don't know why. Me either. <laughs> me either. It's never fast it's so enough. So fast or so slow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's so fast that the groove goes away or it's so yeah. slow that you're like, all right. Any totally. day, any day we can. But get if you here. listen to like JGB recordings, if you listen to old JGB from like the '80s on a tour, you'll hear a Gamora one night. That's. And then the next night. Yeah. You know, and so Different they're back energies. to back, and it just it depends on where you're playing. Are you outside and is it 80 degrees? <laughs> Are you inside and there's nobody there? You yeah. know, it's like. It has yeah. so much to do with the atmosphere. And we would do that too. We'd be on the, Melvin made the set list. I want to put this out there too. I had nothing to do with the J, with the JGB playing Grateful Dead. Everyone, I saw this all over online. So this was like another thing oh, that was like boiling yeah, inside me. You deal with like, you have enough of a following that people talk, right? <laughs> oh, there's so many haters, dude. People hate me. So people are like, who's the buck tooth, flat brim wearing uh-huh. scumbag with the beard? And like, okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, but... But I mean, I get mostly love. But there, you know, if you have any sort of publicity, you're gonna have haters for of course, sure. Of course. So uh, there were so many people. I was being like, "Can we not play these Grateful Dead songs? This is like embarrassing to play Grateful Dead songs." And I'd see on these forums all the time on Reddit and on Facebook and on all sorts of like chats and stuff. People being like, <laughs> "Oh, great! This young kid joins JGB and he's making Melvin play all these Grateful Dead songs." Uh, like, it's all the time, me. I'd be like, "No, it's not me. I'm like begging Melvin to play JGB." Oh, and so. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was just like a compilation of all these things, not to mention a ton of like personal and emotional things that happen on the bus or the way things are dealt with or whatever. I'm like, I'm not into that. Yeah. Um, but so there was one, we played some show in like Denver. I had been thinking about quitting uh, since like February or March of 2019. Like seriously considered it. I I'd, I'd yeah. thought of it before because I there was some just stuff that was hard oh, to deal with. And, stuff. Yeah. and I thought about it a few times before and there was some stuff coming up. I really wanted to play Lockin, um, yeah. which was August of 2019. Yep. And um, there were some real perks to the job, like still playing with a member of Jerry Garcia band, still That's like huge. an easy, easy access to playing with Phil or, you know, you like, being in that lifestyle in that circle and luckily it's carried over now it's like you know i yeah. stuck it out as long you as i could left so that, the connections in yeah the- it became my life but yeah. it, when it first happened i was like whoa this is i was just like dropped into like the real grateful dead world yeah. yeah you know like the first weekend i played with jgb in san francisco i was hanging with phil 
and like chilling with Molo and like all these guys, like all these dudes I've ever had seen on like TV and whatever. And I was hanging back or TV or YouTube or whatever. I was hanging backstage at Terrapin, like chatting with Phil and he was like asking me for advice on the set list. And I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> You know, and this is what age for you? This is like thirty. No, I'm thirty-one now. So okay. yeah, true. Um, yeah, I was it was twenty sixteen when I joined JGB. So um, I was twenty seven. I was gonna be twenty eight that December. Holy shit! Yeah, crazy. Wow, man. So yeah, it uh, it just all happened so fast, and so I hung on to JGB for a long time, and I was like, this is really great for my career, for my networking, and for my reputation, and all that. That's how I found out of you, I, was the JGB stuff. And totally. Ninja. So that was a huge stepping stone for me, and really valuable for me. Cool. So I was hanging on to it, and I was like, I can do this, I can stick it out, I have a good gig, this is great, I'm like getting so much out of this, this is awesome, I'm lucky to be here. And then there was one show in like early June, we were in Colorado, um, playing like a four night run. And there was one show where out of the entire, we started doing like meters tunes and we were doing like stuck in the middle with you at one point. And I was like, <laughs> what are we doing? And so there was one set list in Colorado where there were two Jerry Garcia band songs on the set list out of like 16 songs. Ooh. And that was the day when I was like, this is something's wrong. This is yeah. not right. I can't do this. I wow. just can't. And that was a Sunday. So I told, I was like, Mel, at set break, I was like, Melvin, I got to talk to you after the show. And, and that was that. We were stepping on stage for second set. And I was like, I got to talk to you. And he's like, well, we got early flights. Can we talk this week or whatever? And I was like, nah, it's important. I got to talk to you after the show. So that was that. That really like pushed me over the edge. Just yeah. so, just to set the record straight for everybody. I yeah. couldn't deal with like playing the Grateful Dead. Like I felt like we were not paying enough tribute and respect and love to the Jerry Garcia band, which is why I joined. Zach Nugent right here on Grateful Talks. <laughs> here <great>. it is. <laughs> That's cool, man. I wasn't, I don't think I get wrapped up too much in like the, the connect, oh, and what's going on here and here. But I, I was always curious because I had seen you, you know, trucking along with the band and yeah, sure. um, I figured it's always, there's always a reason for something. But um, sure. where have the, your product, Disco Dead came in <laughs> to play. Was that a one-off show thing or was that? No, Something. I did that for a little while, and people still ask about it, but I don't know. That also, same thing for me. It was like a fun project, and people want more, but I'm like, it's almost too, like, slapstick Grateful Dead. Like, I, yeah. you know, I got to so, find a, a way to keep doing that because people really like it, but I don't want to, like, just do Disco Style Grateful Dead. So, yeah, I was going to ask, what Disco Dead, I imagine you're just, you're cranking up the tempo on tunes and, and making them funky and... Yeah, keeping them up, up a little bit. It's really up to the drummer. It's four okay. on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> Gotcha. You one know, drummer, just, two drummers for that? One drummer usually for Disco okay. Dead. Cool. We dress in all white. We use lots of fog. <laughs> you know, and it's like, what do you like just take the go to, to the heaven river? album cover? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, uh, what is genuine Grateful Dead playing projects? You know, what does that look like for you? And where are you trying to take that? Obviously, we're in a weird time. So, we're doing a lot of solo stuff and self exploration and all that. But, Totally. Uh, so I've realized, like I sort of explained it all in the things we've been talking about, but I've realized since I started playing guitar and trying out all these different bands and then being in JGB, which forced me to do something that I like so don't believe in, yeah. you know, really, which is fine. I like, got to try all of this stuff on and see how it all fits. You've been there. And um, I went from being like, it has to be like this, it has to sound like this, and it has to whatever, and being forced to play over here, this style with JGB where it's like not like that at all. Mm -hmm. It made me realize that I was like, okay, it can sort of be here. It's still got to be close to this, like whatever, because yeah. I will take to For the grave. Yeah, like yeah. I'm going to take to the grave what I said earlier that like there has to be these, these nuggets to remind people like, it's okay. This music is in good hands. Yeah. Here's a taste of what you had at the Fillmore <laughs> and whatever, blah, 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 blah. We could it's play so that, here. but this is how we're going to play it. And hopefully you like it too. Totally, totally. But here's a little rub on your back because I know this can be scary, you know? And yes. so yes, there were so many moments, like I was saying with JGB, where we would take them to this scary place and we wouldn't comfort them, wow. you know? Yeah. That night where we That's played two JGB shit, songs yeah. out of, out of a, a, you know, a dozen and a half songs, we played two JGB tunes. Yeah. I was like, these people are going to be scared. They're not going to be cozy, you know? It's so interesting too because you're still like – 
arguably delivering good music because you got the musicianship up there. Yeah, like, it's a great. It's one of the best shakedowns you'll probably ever hear. Yeah, but it's but not. It's, like, it's it's a JG. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot to. Un- I guess we've already unpacked. There's a lot. Stuff, We're gonna like, have to do an episode too. I know. Just <laughs> paying proper <laughs> tribute. Right. Well, I I really love that you're willing to to say something like that because I think it's interesting. I I will flop on on both sides of the issue. Like part of me is, you know, play it how you want, man. You know, yeah, it's, mu- it's music and go out and, and do this and, and bring your spirit to it. But also there's that, like, I don't know if it's a stickler part or if it's just a, just a matter of like, okay, I've heard this enough to know that th- this is supposed to happen. And, and this is what I want to happen in my head. And when it doesn't happen, then yeah, it, it kind of, there's some magic lost or some, element of the energy that's changed where it's less grateful dead spirity and uh, totally it's it's hard to talk about without kind of getting all voodoo and <laughs> for sure yeah it's crazy it's a little you know it's, it's just amazing to me when i would see music when i would see like rat dog or growing up seeing dark star dark yeah. star is pretty spot on but these little things that i like look for now that nobody does like in um i'm just thinking of little examples but in like terrapin yeah um brand new crescent You know, Jerry would always do yep. that. Yep. And so that's like, okay, it's like we're safe. Things are good. They know it. <laughs> you want to play the chords however you want, you know? Yeah. It is kind of, it's just a matter of uh I think you're almost like by including those, you are without having to prove yourself, you're proving yourself. Sure. It's it, it's the way of like you're not overplaying, you're not like, hey, look at me, I'm really good at this. You can yeah. just include that. And then somebody goes, oh, I, okay. Or wearing a, a Dancing Bears t-shirt in public and another deadhead sees you. And go, oh, they know what's yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy like, gets it. Yeah, there's some there's some element to throwing that stuff in there. God, so Ooh. how many years of like listening and shedding and you said you weren't going in and like learning solo for solo for most of it, but you did a fair amount of that work early on. I did that early on. I mean, I'm still... I have got serious radio in my car and it's like, I got all these presets, but it's only ever on number one, which is the Grateful Dead channel. (laughs) Anytime I can listen to this stuff and like learn something, I'll still, I was the other day I was working on, um, on Samson Delilah where it goes, Jerry does that. But right after the. A little bluegrass lick right there. And yep. so I was listening to different versions of that, and I was like, okay, what is it? And I was trying to figure out if it was like uh, a hammer on and pull off, but I think it's a slide. Okay. Yeah, I can I was hear trying that. I figure it out, but I was like, that needs to be just right. And then I can do whatever I want. I can do my version of Samson Delilah. Yep. But I'm going to give him that little nugget and be like, this is your home. That's you so know? cool. Yeah. And so that's something I was working on just this week. I've been playing this music professionally for a decade now. and playing this music for 20 years so, and I'm still figuring out little stuff like that. Was 2015 um, a turning point with your culture? Like having yeah. played pre Grateful Dead reunion and then post totally. obviously the date 2016, you picking up with JGB and stuff. That's huge. So yeah. Yeah. The market like just blew up after 2015 do, or during 2015. Do you feel, you know? I'm sure it's mostly joy. Cause now you have, you know, a bigger audience of fans, but were you at all like, fuck, I got here first. <laughs> like, um, no, you know what? The fans are so good about remembering that and respecting that. That's cool. Yeah. They're so loyal. And like, I think if a billion more guys better than me popped up today, yeah. I still have such a solid chunk of my fans who like, I can feel how much they love me and how much they appreciate it. That's awesome. And they would still come with me, you know? That's super cool. That's it. And it doesn't have to be like, they would love the other guys too. It doesn't have to be like all yeah. or nothing, you know? Yeah, there's but. not so much uh i'm sure you would know this way more than i do but the the competition in this scene and maybe I, i'm not speaking to necessarily bands but at least from an appreciator and from a fan and musician's standpoint that yeah. doesn't play in in that scene um everybody seems real supportive like for the most part crazy you, you know i have this I had the uh, the Channeling Jerry book that I've been looking and, and reading those interviews, and there's so many people, and they're all fans of each other, and they're all talking about, yeah, Jeff Matson's, you know, no. Jeff Matson's huge for me. He was he was there since the beginning, and like, it's so cool. It's really neat that everybody goes back. We all have the same favorite band, and right. you know, we're all trying to build something off of that. But uh, 
That's amazing. I forget what my question was <laughs> related to that. I was just. It, I, we're just circling around like the support and the yeah, uh, you, loyalty you, and devotion. You have very fans. loyal fans, and um, that's led to, you know, it's very helpful. Thank God there's loyal fans in the internet era. I know, right man. <laughs> I know. It's so funny. I started doing so when quarantine started in March. Yeah. Um, you guys were I started on, doing. Oh, you weren't that? on tour, were you? Because you would you had left in August. But Daniel, I left in August. I was in San Francisco playing shows. I got home on like March 7th. OK. OK. So right before Francisco. like I think 16th, 20th, something was when it. all. Yeah. The 14th was my last show. OK. OK. Yep. Uh, and then I had shows like that was in Burlington and I had shows in like Rochester and Chicago and Buffalo that were all canceled. That were like the gotcha. following week. Wow. So I started doing these live streams and it was like amazing how quickly this like family thing started. And I had like these, I'm notoriously amazing at um, winning things out of claw machines. Really? That's at, like rest fun, areas. Yeah, I can just like, I'm fact. like, someone give me five bucks. I'll empty that machine out right now. That's hilarious. Always. We'd be on tour and the people, we'd be at like Walmart and they'd be like paying for their stuff. And I would go just like get everybody a toy out of the claw machine. Is there a secret that you know that we don't or is? No, it's just, it's like, <laughs> it's like within me. Okay. Yeah. Just it's like, happens? I just like, I walk over and there's like a, an orange orb around like the T-Rex. And I'm That's like hilarious. that, I can get that one. And so, uh, anyway, I started putting these, I have these little stuffed animals and like, I have a nephew who's four, so I give him Perfect. whatever, but like, yeah. What else am I gonna do with these stupid things? But I can't throw them out because they're like they're like they're road dogs, you know. They're cute, yeah. They're cute. They're cute <laughs> as hell. And so uh, in the, my streams, I started putting them like behind me. I started this like as a couch tour, and I was sitting on my couch in my old it. apartment. Yeah. And uh, I put them like on the on the couch over my shoulders, and um, people were like all over it, and they were like, calling like the Animal Kingdom, and they were like like what's the wolf doing to the pig today, That's and like. Hilarious. I started like rearranging them and I felt like people sometimes were watching the stream as much to see what like the For animals were doing. That storyline in the background. Yeah. That's so cool. And so um, it's silly and doofy, but it's like, it just goes to show like how much fun these people are, these fans and like this community yep. and like how silly it can be. And like, it doesn't have to be like this crazy serious thing, you know, like, um, yeah, it just, that was like such a great example for me that people are just like looking for, really like love and friendship and something familiar all over the place. Yep. And like if you come hear some good music and like goof around about the animals, that's going to make them be loyal. It's meme in a way to have, yeah. like, I love the memes that come out of this circle, totally. especially too, the people man. that are just so like deep into it that they can create yeah. these huge, I don't know if it's juxtapositions of things, but like just funny content comes out of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So you started this stream in March and what did, where did it go for you? Were you doing it consistently weekly? Was it yeah, I was doing it sometimes twice a week. When we first started out, after the first one, I had like 12,000 views in like 90 minutes, which was Holy great. Holy shit, um, that's awesome. That's like 50 was, shares or so, probably. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was really nice. And I've got a great team. Um, my publicist, Bruce Levy. Cool. And, I know uh, that name. Yeah, he's a great dude. And he um, he helps me out so much with all this stuff. So I can't, I couldn't pull half this, especially this virtual stuff off without him. Uh, and so he would share like crazy. He's a member of all these groups and people know what he does and you know what he's good for. And um, they count on him for these shares and spreading the good word about all this music, mine and other virtual music. And so he was sharing the hell out of it. And um, at first we were getting like upwards of 10,000 views every stream. It's pretty good. It's great. And uh, that it used like a direct correlation <clears throat> with the weather. It was like there would be a cold night and my views would be up or there'd be like a nicer night and people were maybe playing outside or like, Oh my God, we can get out of the house and yeah. like breathe fresh air and eat in the backyard or whatever. Yep. And the views would go down. Wow. And so I had this great viewership. And then for the summer, yeah. it tapered off in like May. Yep. And by June I was like, okay, I'm going to take a break from these shows. Yep. Um, just because it like, I didn't want it to lose its luster. Yep. And uh, I wanted to be able to come back and do it and have it be special this fall, winter. So I got super lucky in Vermont. I didn't think I was going to be playing any shows. And I was super, I won't take any indoor shows still. But I was so blessed to have like a ton of outdoor, safe, distance, responsible shows awesome. fall into my lap. And I had almost sort of like a normal summer for a minute. That's cool. Yeah, I saw enough posts about some shows. And it didn't seem like it was like huge tour. But you'd no. see like a post of three or four like a block of four and i'm like damn 
damn, Zach skipped four shows in this time. I know, man. Awesome. I was so lucky. It was great. The farthest I went was like Maine and New Hampshire. And, Perfect. You know, I'd like go play these shows New and England make sure it's super distance and then quarantine at home for two weeks. Yeah. But it was worth it. It was great. It's awesome. Um, and actually just this past, so I just moved everything over to Twitch. Cool. Uh, so you're, you're saw, taking off the Facebook stuff where it started moving over to Twitch. I don't like Twitch. Facebook. I wish I didn't have to have a Facebook. It's it's a weird place. I like so many aspects of it. And Me too. And I, I don't like the other 90%. <laughs> right, exactly. That's a, yeah, couldn't have said it better myself. That's how we connected. You know, that's the only yeah. reason I'm here doing this. Yep, exactly. It's, but, uh, it's been a great man, hub for the show. Yeah so, yeah. so so what inspired that? Obviously, you see, like Twitch is one of those things where I kind of, I I don't know if it's like a personal, like I'm like fuck, I wish I had gotten there first. But me too, and I, I feel like I like got in at a good time, but I'm still late. You're still on the curve for sure, but like yeah, there's but I'm late. the Gen Zs got they beat us there. <laughs> Trey, Trey, Trey did it. I don't know who told Trey like go stream on Twitch, but whoever he it probably was, probably got I a family member, a really young kid, family member yeah. somewhere in there. So, so I saw that first. I'm not a huge fish fan. Like I'm not like a loyal. I don't know. Same. I couldn't name more than eight or ten fish songs. That's better than um, I could do. And that's only because I'm like submerged in it. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I respect the hell out of it. I've met all those guys. I've played with some of those guys. I have a language doc. Like I love, and that music is fantastic. But Fish itself is just a little silly for me. Yeah. Um, and Fish is like, Fish is like the party for me and Grateful Dead is like, is church. I'm going to have to show this, uh, this snippet to my roommates because we were literally talking about this yesterday. So <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I think I used the word silly. So continue. <laughs> anyway. It is. It's just too silly for yeah. me. Um, yeah, but anyway, uh, Trey, we're you know, I'm, yeah. some of Trey's um, Trey and Stasio bands bandmates uh, are some of my closest friends. Tony Markellis, his bass player, is one of my very best buddies. Cool. This is in and, in in tab. Do you say tab? Yeah, T A B. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, tab. Tab. <laughs> um, this is in tab. So Tony's one of my very closest buddies, and Russ, the drummer, is a, another very close friend of mine. I've gotten cl super close with Tony over the years, but Russ actually actually introduced me to Tony. And that's still their home base is sort of Burlington that are those folks or Ross is here in Vermont and Tony's in upstate New York. Okay, cool. So a couple by. hours away from me. So nice. we play together a lot. Um, and so, you know, I'm always interested in what fish is doing and what Trey is doing. And they're very smart businessmen yeah. and they're super fun musicians. You know, like every, I love their ideas. I'm jealous of everything they do. I'm like, why didn't I think of that? And Twitch included. Yeah. So Trey did this Twitch stream at the Beacon. He's doing this whole series of them right now on Friday nights. And I was like, well, that's a great idea. I'm going to watch that. And I'm going to watch because I can see Tony and Russ on, like, on the big screen. And I'm, you know, those are my boys. That's awesome. And so you know, my, Dan and I have made the trip. We went out to Cleveland um, and hung with Trey and Tony and Russ for like the trio shows for the, uh, the trio tour when awesome. he did that maybe two years ago or so. We're always trying to support those guys and it's a great hang trey is super fun to hang with and yep. tony and russ are amazing dudes so you would imagine. that's awesome yeah so happy to support and hang in um any way we can and so uh definitely wanted to check out the stream and i checked out the trey stream three weeks ago whenever the first one was and i was like i just like two hours straight of goosebumps and like drooling wow and i was like i like didn't sleep that night and i was like this is a you thing just inspired felt good yeah i yeah. was like this shame on everyone else for not thinking of this already and this is smart and it feels good and it feels like the future and i talked to dan the next day and dan was like that is the future yeah, like i didn't even say anything yep. i didn't even mention it to dan and he was like did you see what happened last night and i was like yes so, i can't remember where the timing was of daniel and my podcast but we uh i think it had just happened maybe and he was, just he was like, you could see that there was this buzz going on in his head from it. We hit each other up and we were like, uh, dude. <laughs> and so um, awesome. people will tell you about me for like for better or for worse. Uh, I like get I'm super impulsive and I'm super driven and I like I won't sleep until something's done. Gotta get so it. someone's I, I'll wake up one day and be like, mm, I need a deck on the back of my house. And I'm like, <laughs> I, by, by two o'clock, I'm like hammering nails. You yeah, know? I feel that. Uh, that's just who I am. And it's like, it's gotten me into a lot of trouble, but it's also gotten me to where I am too, you know? And so it's a blessing and a curse. And anyone, I'm sure Dan will be happy to tell you that. But anyway, I was like, I'm going to be the next dude doing a live stream on Twitch. Cool. In this world, at least, you yeah. know, I see like hip hop artists and rappers doing yes, stuff on exactly. there. 
been Travis there for Scott, a long, you know, like beat making it. stuff. People that are like producers, they've been dominating that shit for a long time. Yeah, totally. But no one's like playing guitar on Twitch right now. Yeah, I tried a little but, bit early on in quarantine. You did? I, I had the audience wasn't there. You know, I just don't have the following. So there's still not. You know, yeah. I had my. I did. I went live on Twitch on Wednesday night. Or I was Thursday looking. Night. You had like 40, 50 people. I thought for. Yeah, I did. So right now I have, I think, like 500 views. Okay. Three three days later, two days later. But that's opposed to like 12,000 views after on 90 Facebook. minutes on Facebook. Yeah. That's the weird part about Facebook is the views are there, but like is that engagement even worth right, the, right, the right. way more interactive experience you get on Twitch from fans that are able to like live chat in an effective right. manner? Because you just, I don't know. Can, sorry, I'm, I'm hyper now and interrupting about Twitch. No, you're fine. This is what it's all about. So, uh, so you start... Uh, I, so I'm determined to bring those people over. I'm going to have 12,000 views on Hell Twitch yeah. after 90 minutes at uh-huh. some point. So I'm curious to see what that road looks like, but I won't do it anywhere else. You know, I'll upload the videos to like YouTube, to my YouTube channel after and stuff yeah. so people can easily view them. Uh, although they, that pains me. This is What's that? Oh, sorry. I was going to say they save for, is it two weeks on Twitch and then they're gone until you're a certain so. level of like partner or something? Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to push them all over to YouTube. Um, and we'll see what happens with that. I, it pains me to like put them on another platform because I I want to like channel everything to one place. Yeah, it's like having I don't want five hundred views on Twitch and five hundred on YouTube. I want a thousand on Twitch. Yeah, but you know I like now that I'm thir- almost thirty two years old, I'm starting to realize I can't always have what I want. So have to make some um, compromises. I'll compromise. I might I'm have to put start on YouTube too. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll start sometime. What is um? Because Twitch is cool. And I, I'm so fascinated by this live streaming stuff because it's, it's really neat. And to like, I don't know if you notice this or get this feeling, but for me, it saved me from the like inevitable depression of live shows being canceled when I could log in. Uh, I don't know if you saw Socially Distant Fest, but it's just a big yeah. group. And, you know, I started streaming in there. And to see that number of like 50 just hang out in your, in your top left corner or wherever. It gave you that same, or gave me the same, like, oh shit, I'm playing for other people right now. I have the yeah. same nerves. The thing that you didn't get is the when people are fucking grooving and like you can I see know. and feel that energy back. That that's huge, and that I cannot wait for when that can hopefully come back. But me too, man. The applause I, after a song. Oh my god, dude! And when when you just when you know the audience is in it, you don't even need any confirmation. Yep. It's just that's that is. Hey, oh, I miss it. I miss that feeling like a fucking junkie. But me too, man. I and I got to have so I it, I was playing all spring, and I'd finish like I I do like a twenty minute whatever Terrapin Uncle John like I do some crazy thing, and the whole time I'd be like, all right, I'm playing well right now. This is going really well. Yeah. And I would see the comments, people being like, oh my god, this is insane. I'm Fire, so I'm, yeah. About this, and then I play the last note, you know. You're like, cool. <laughs> and it'd be like that, and I'd be like, oh, this is so gross. This is weird. It's like silent. It feels like self indulgent almost. You're like, am I just playing yeah. this for me? But yeah, totally. You know, you're it was not. Like but embarrassing, yeah. and I was like, what is going on? Yeah. But then I got used to it, and I like instead of listening for the applause, I would like look for the comments and be like, okay, they loved it. There's yeah. my applause. Yep. Um, and when I started playing, so I did that from like March to June um, for you know solid three months anyway. And then when I started playing shows again, yeah. Uh, even you know there were small shows there for like 60, 80, maybe a hundred people. It's enough tiny. to fill that tank though a little bit. Enough to fill the tank, and people would clap, and I would be like. It was surprising the first couple of times. Dude, I almost like, cried. I felt like I was like 17 again, and like people were first clapping yeah. for me playing my instrument. And you I was get like, that adrenaline is... rush, like, oh, yeah, Whoa. totally. It was crazy, and I was like, I'm like, you have to get used to this again. Yeah. So, um, it's it's crazy the way we adjust, you know. That, so, speaking of all this adjusting, what's um some of the cool like? What do you want to do on Twitch that sets you apart, other than being like you know doing an acoustic show on twitch or a full band show on twitch uh what do we how do we make this interactive part more totally that's interactive is exactly what i want to do okay. so i want to build a little of a little bit of a platform right now with some solo acoustic maybe some duo acoustic and a couple full band things on twitch but then i want people i want to do an interactive thing where people are saying like 
we can do a pre song bank or whatever, depending on who I'm playing with and, and what songs they know. I know most of them, but I may play with someone who only knows 50 or whatever. Yeah. And um, I've got such a great collection of gear too. I would love to have like my guitars hanging around and people be like, pick the guitar hey. for a donation or something. <laughs> oh, well, that's another idea. I was envisioning people be like, okay, I want you to play. They love each other on the Travis Bean right now. That's awesome, dude. You know? Killer. And do that for people. Have like this super interactive whatever because I remember going to so many shows when I was little and they would have like, you know, I'd be I'd see Dark Star and they'd be doing like a 77 show and I'd be like, "Please, please, please, Lazy Lightning. Please, please, please." And they wouldn't play it and I'd be like, "Ah, I just want to see them play Lazy Lightning on that guitar." And if you, you could know? have typed that in the comments section on the If Dark I just could have typed that in the comments section. You know, so That's I think it. there's something there. Yeah. And I, wow. So is this mostly like, I also want to talk about Patreon too, because I think that while separate, they are interlinked. Yeah, I think um, so too. Uh, the musician, how many of your fans are musicians? Because this is a very, it's such a musician oriented genre. I wonder genre. that too. It's hard to tell. I think maybe 30 to 40% of my fans are musicians. That's it's cool. something I think about a, a bunch and try to figure out. I should do a, uh, like a poll on Insta and just you see. You could definitely get a representative sample somehow. Uh, but it's amazing how, so there's people who are musicians and then there's people who like know nothing about any of it. Yeah. But there's such a huge, huge chunk of people who have no idea like how to sing a note or have never picked up a guitar in their life. Yeah. But they're like, that's the Travis Bean and it sounds like that or whatever. Yes, you know? exactly. It's the same type of people that uh, were really good at archiving show, like, oh, that's my favorite dead show. Is this totally. Day. You know, those totally. folks with those brains. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, awesome, man. So um, they're out there. There's like there's heads and gearheads out there everywhere, yep. and a lot of them are fans. And so um, I would love to be able to give like seventeen year old me, who's out there now in some other body or soul, yep. like this experience that maybe never got to happen. You yeah. know, like that freedom or like that control or power would be so fun. Yep. And you, uh, you're at the helm of so much talent and, you know, put that the gear combination or the gear aspect with it. You you can totally. literally recreate an yeah. experience for anybody at any know. given moment. So that's a that's a really cool platform. I'm excited yeah. to see uh, see how that shifts the culture a little bit. Maybe we'll have more deadheads on Twitch. It'll be a viable. Market. Dude, I would love that. Be I sick, that dude. Sometimes. I don't know what's uh, like. I only knew young people. And I'm saying young people. I'm. 24 but yeah. younger than myself people that are on it and they're watching games typically is how i, I think it came to be and then the production stuff started happening and right um there were a lot of people on there how many what's the user base do you know i'm not sure but dan and i were just talking yesterday about oops i'm sorry i kind of want to and i were just talking yesterday about um how you can just scroll through and look at, yeah, I'm curious to see what it 15 is. 15 million daily active users. Yeah, you can scroll through and out of like the thousands, hundreds of thousands of channels, there's a large percent that have like a thousand viewers at any given time. Wow. That's a lot. Just hanging you know, out. Pile those all up. That's a lot of users. So 15 million daily users. And so what's our, I'm trying to think of like the conversion rate of what your channel needs to have in order to have a certain number, like a hundred audience members at a given time. If you're doing a weekly stream, what does that look like in terms of followers? You think I've just started my channel a week ago. I've got like 130 followers. Sweet. And, I'll go um, and follow it. If I haven't, I need to make sure. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, but I found that about half of those are viewing at any given time. Cool. Wow. So that's pretty nice. So the people that are on Twitch are on Twitch. Like, People are on Twitch or on Twitch. Granted, I've been pumping it up being like, follow my Twitch and I'm going live for the first time. But, you know, it's yes. sort of this yes. spotlighted, concentrated um, event. I like the idea of just being able to like hop on though. It's two o'clock on a Thursday. Me too. Like I feel like playing right now. I got this idea to get out. I want to play yeah. with this looper pedal, whatever. I'm going to practice some shit real quick and people can watch me practice. Yes. That's, that's cool stuff. I think that's really cool. Because that's what cool. people want to see how the hot dogs are made, you know? So true. Like so we, we want to see, they want to know why I left JGB. They want to see how we practice. They want to know yep. what you're doing when you pick up your guitar, you know? 
Yep, I love it, man. I think this is also a great. Thank you for being the first to bring a uh, guitar on. We're, uh, yeah, of course. This is kind of. I'm trying to make this in not like lessons and stuff, but just for people to like have an instrument and be able sure. to access it if they need to. Like, there's yeah. so many good examples that you've already come up with where, without an instrument, you can kind of do 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 it, but it's yeah. not going to get the same effect across. So. Right. Yeah. It's nice to be able to have this tool right here. So, uh, full band streams coming through. Uh, who are you playing with nowadays? You know, it varies a bunch. I go back and forth between like having a solid band and just like having that consistency and building on that. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, flopping back to like a rotating sort of band and keeping that excitement and that freshness. Yeah. I think eventually before too long, I'm going to go full time with like one band and, and work on cool. building that because that's one day feels more reliable and more comfortable. But yeah, playing with the same folks all the time when you just. Oh man, it's awesome. How good bands get good. Yep. You know, um, and so like you can take amazing players and put them all together and have a great show, but there's, yeah, there's something that happens when like, you know, you guys are all, it's like being in a band is like being in a, a five way marriage or something, you know, whatever. You say it's a like, relationship. Yeah. <laughs> it is it's like being in a relationship with five people. Yep. And so, um, you know, the good with the bad, you're going to get into arguments. You're going to want to, you're going to need a day away from each other or whatever, but you're also going to know, like <laughs> you're going to know the way whoever curls his lip before he plays that baseline, yeah. or, you know, whatever. Or you just start saying like, I've noticed within a year of, of joining this band and, and playing with my fellow melody maker, as I call him, yeah. uh, the keys, man dan he uh we just every once in a while we're just playing the same riff or like harmonizing with each other yep. completely just happening totally and it's, and that's the best feeling out. on earth and, yeah it's incredible like to look over and go oh shit we both just heard that yep. the, from the airwaves however music you know totally. pours through us that was it's a cool feeling to have it's yeah, amazing it's amazing so <sighs> so uh, patreon you're doing this in addition to twitch it's a yeah. different platform it's a, a pay to unlock lessons is sort of the yeah so right now i'm doing three different tiers i'm doing like um every two weeks i'm doing like a one minute tip being cool. like here's how i just i'm gonna bend like this just add a little more flavor or whatever try this next time you practice just a one yeah. quick little thing which is five bucks a month cool so, that's pretty whatever. easy it's like a cup of coffee Yep. I figured that was like the one that people would be most comfortable with. But, yep. um, and then the next tier is eight bucks and it's sort of the same idea, but it's a little longer. Those tend to be like four or five minutes long. Yeah. Instead of being like, here, try this out. It's more like, here's what I like to do. Here's why I like to do it. Here's where you could use it, try it out. And maybe we'll like touch back on it next week too. Okay. Nice. Um, and then for 30 bucks a month, which is, it's a really good deal. I mean, it sounds like I'm, of course, I'm just pitching my Patreon. Dude, but, but like, shit, if you're not spending any other money anywhere else on guitar lessons and you spend $30, which is like less than an hour, that's like half an hour lesson. I charge you know, like, 90 bucks an hour for guitar lessons. Yeah. And yeah. so the, for 30 bucks, you get the a full song breakdown once a week, which is like a 10 or 15 minute lesson. That's huge. Um, yeah. So, you know, you're getting a lot of content for for not a lot of money and um it's fun for me to do like i love teaching and yeah. um it can be hard with like people's schedules or whatever or like i have a lot of people on the west coast so people are like okay cool i could do 8 p.m after dinner tonight and you're like well it's, so it's 11 i'm in bed you know yeah so um and with the virtual lessons and not having like regular students that come to my place every week or whatever unless you're recording a Zoom call or something, it's just like you, you learn it, you take some notes and you're done. But with the Patreon, yeah. you can go back and watch it as many times as you want. Having a downloadable file is, yeah. is big. Yeah. That's yeah. uh, It's really interesting to think about the, the model of instead of the one-on-one -on -one instruction, which is kind of the standard, I think, yep. um, for at least instrument stuff. You, you have one-on-one -on -one and then you're going to now it's still one-on-one, -on -one, but it's one on everybody. But it's yeah on your it's such a strange model that hasn't totally. really existed before. But I think it's awesome that you can bring this level of like behind the scenes to the listener because there, yeah, there wasn't thanks, an man. outlet to you know you weren't recording an album of like this is how I practice. But you can do right. that and people will watch it and people will pay for it too. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. It's cool, man. 
I, uh, I had a couple more questions that I actually wrote down, which is really that's the first for me <laughs> writing <laughs> questions down. But I did. I wanted to make sure that I didn't uh, let you get away without asking this. Yeah, sure. What's up? Um, so let's see. OK, I, I, we, we got to most of them. But um, what's it like to play one of Jerry's guitars? And like, how, can you talk about that? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Um, I saw so I think. I'm lucky enough to have played um, 11 of Jerry's guitars. At this oh, I thought it was nine, so it's gone up too? It's gone up. Uh, <laughs> God. And um, so a bunch of Jerry's guitars were custom, um, yep. as everyone knows, Wolf, Tiger, Rosebud, all these Irwins and Cripes. Uh, and Alembic stuff early, early on was all highly customized. Um, but I think the thing that sticks with them, they're, they're amazing because, uh, it's a combination probably of like the builder knowing what Jerry likes and then it going, I'm, I'm sure that Jerry got all of these guitars, um, at least early on before like Irwin was building Tiger and Rose, but he got these guitars and probably just gutted them immediately. Um, and I know the guitars like the Travis Beans and Wolf that we know about, like, you know, there were so many different incarnations. We know about these like rebuilds and these yeah. tweaking. Yeah. Waldo has every single iteration documented. and yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So there's all that that we know about. And I think there's probably a lot where Jerry probably got the guitar and was like, OK, change this, this, this and this before the show in two weeks or whatever. Yep. Um, and so it all sort of uh, what I'm what I'm getting to, it all sorts sort of links together. But so I'm going to step to a different sort of subject right now and I'll link them together in a second. Yeah. But the guitars, what has blown me away um, almost, I don't know if I can say more than playing guitars like Wolf and, and Alligator and those uh, are the guitar, like the stock guitars that Jerry owned. So like I've played his um, Gibson Super 400. It's a 1942. It's the blonde one that's in like the smoke gets in your eyes video. I think I've seen a picture. Do you have a picture of you with that one? I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. There's all one right? there somewhere. That's it's a cool. big blonde jumbo like jazz yep, box. Yep, yep. Gibson. Yep. Uh, and that's stock. That's brand. That's you know just like it's brand new. It's a 1942, which is cool. It's the same year as Jerry's birth. Wow. Um, but I get to play that one pretty often. And it just blows me away what a great guitar it is. And so, um, and I've had this experience with every stock guitar or just like straight, you know, whatever guitar that Jerry has purchased or owned that wasn't a custom. And it just, I say this all the time, but like that guy knew how to pick them, you know? Like, so you're kind of suggesting that a, a guitar that was left stock by Jerry really me like, if it was worth leaving stock, it's worth something. Yeah, and I think he probably he probably wanted a Super 400 at some point, and he probably played 20 of them and was like, this one. You know, he knew how to pick them. The um, Kid Candelario and Steve Parrish tell me all the time, too, that if Jerry was, he wanted a Mutron or whatever, he would go to a guitar shop in San Rafael or wherever, and they'd have eight Mutrons in stock, and he would play all of them and be like, okay, this one. You know, because That's pretty interesting. I would have we um, we had Howard Danchik, who's one of the most amazing dudes I know, uh, and he also did a lot of front of house for the Grateful Dead, and he um, oh cool, yeah he he's just huge in like the Meyer sound world. Uh, he did front of house for JGB a bunch, and um, he loved. I had like all I've got a bunch of four twenty ones, and he had, cool. I have all these vintage mics, and always trying cool stuff out. And he loves the Sennheiser nine hundred six, which is just a little one hundred and eighty nine dollar mic that you can get at Guitar Center. Yep. And so he would insist on uh, using those on me. I'd be like, "What? Well, okay, whatever, fine." It's Howard. And so yeah. we'd use those. And after one show, uh, I was like, "Howard, you finally sold me." We have we had the in ear monitors in JGB, so we could hear everything right. Like. Yep. through headphones. It was super, super clear and crisp. And so um, I, after one show, we were in uh, Nevada somewhere and I was like, Howard, you just sold me. I, I just fell in love with the 906. And he was like, huh, all right. I unboxed that one today. He's like, I'll put a stripe on, I'll put a mark on it and that one will be yours. And I was like, well, it's probably just like the way you mixed it or, you know, just like, yeah, you, I think I the realized angle on the cab or something. Yeah. And he was like, nope, if I've learned one thing over the years, it's that every piece of gear is different. That's and, pretty cool. And he was like, if, he's like, I've got six of these mics, but this is, this is one I just opened up today that you've never used before. And if today this is the exact mic, like them, that's your mic. And I was like, <sighs> okay. Yeah. I sort of have like goosebumps right now. Like, no, I love that shit. Yeah, it, so it speaks to the intentionality of like the Grateful Dead and 
They tested everything. They, they, they told me that like they were buying guitar tuners and they would like test each tuner and be like, this is the best one. Of the same model, they would test 10 of the same one. Yeah, this Korg is definitely better. <laughs> it's crazy, <laughs> man, but I can, I can get behind it. You know? I like it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's consistent, if anything. Like, they're not yeah. sparing any um, expense, I guess. No, no, no. If, if and so to circle back to the guitars, I think whether they were stock or custom, because a lot of, there were a lot of custom guitars handed to Jerry that we never heard about or saw. You know, he would pass sure. them on. He had tons of guitars, and he was super generous. He would give them away. Awesome. Um, uh, but the ones that he hung on to and decided to play out of the almost dozen that I've had a chance to like play for a good amount of time, uh, they are all like the best guitars I've ever played. And it's not just, of course there's like Mojo and like, Oh my God, this is, this is Wolf or whatever. Was Wolf the trippiest for you or what Tiger? Or Wolf was probably the trippiest because when I was like 13, my dad and I were watching the closing of Winterland DVD and he was like, oh, what's your shit. goal with all this? What do you want to do with all this music? And I was like, I want to play that guitar. <laughs> that's my and that's so, a personal goal of mine as well. So yeah. <laughs> that's huge. So uh, yeah, years later, I was playing it. You know, my dad came to the show and we're like backstage. He's holding it. It was just like this crazy that's night. The first time I ever played it. Um, oh, what a warm feeling that gives me. That's dude, sweet. it's crazy. But so, yeah, any guitar that Jerry loved that was stock or custom that he hung on to, has, yeah. he knew how to pick a guitar. And so they're all just That's like, killer. whoa. And so I've sort of taken that. You know, I, have, I have a large guitar collection. And um, after learning that and realizing that, I've let some go. And I've been more careful when picking. And I've um, looked at, at different things when, when shopping or when checking out a guitar. Cool. And uh, that's a feeling I'd never felt before. Like when I played those guitars, I was like, wow, this is like, I've only felt this maybe on one or two guitars ever. This is what it's meant to feel like, though. When well, it's meant, to, meant to feel like. And so, yeah, it's like easy to see like a pretty shiny guitar or whatever. Be like, okay, I want that with my collection. Yeah. But when you play it, you'll like, you'll know. Yeah, you know? that's so true. Man, I, I worked at this store, actually. Shout out Low Vintage Guitar. If you're ever in uh, Burlington, North Carolina, absolutely oh, stop cool. here. You would have a blast. Um, Ed right and Will are nicest, nicest folks in the world. But right on. there were, there were, um, you know, forty thousand dollar guitars hanging yeah. on the wall, and you, I got to pick it up. I changed strings on a Lloyd Lore, hundred seventy five thousand dollar mandolin, and yep. you know, I'm surrounded by just the the top of the top of all this acoustic guitar stuff. And you, every once in a while, one would come in and you pick it up off the wall and you're like, oh, this one isn't going to last long. And somebody, yeah. sure enough, would come in, find it, play it, buy it just instantly. Isn't it amazing being surrounded by guitars like that too? Like a bunch of twenty or $40,000 guitars. How many of them aren't great? Some of them you're like, okay, I see why somebody that likes this era of guitars would pay this for this guitar. Yeah. But personally, it's not. Like it's just, okay, cool. I played a, a. Money is not ever like the final determining factor. No. You would think that you'd pick up a guitar that was like over fifteen thousand dollars, and there would be no such thing as a bad one or one that you the best in love thing with. I've ever played. Yeah, but sometimes it's just about like, oh well, this one cost fifteen thousand dollars because the tuners weren't changed. Shit, I'll take the replaced tuners right. for a hefty discount because yeah, I right. like the way it plays and sounds better and it's actually functional up here. Like there's Dude, I, one of my favorite guitars that I have is it's it's made by Fullerton Guitars. And yeah, was, I know Fullerton. I was just hanging at Guitar Center one day, like talking to my dudes there, and it was on the counter and it was just it was it's an acoustic and I was just strumming it, playing along, and I was like, What is this thing? And they were like, I don't know, someone just traded it in for a squire or whatever. And I was like, How much is it? And they were like fifty nine ninety nine. You're and like, I was like, yeah, this, is this is one of the best acoustic guitars I've ever played. It's in my living room right now. I That's researched so it. Funny. They like it was it was eighty nine ninety nine new. It's like it's black. It's not. I think there's like probably not a whole lot of wood of any sort used on it. When I hijack your Twitch stream, saying you have to play all your dead songs on the Fullerton, <laughs> and people are getting mad. That's me. That'll be right. Me. It's a great guitar. It just goes to show, you know, like I, you know, I own some crazy guitars, and yeah. This sixty dollar guitar is one of my favorite to, like go tos to pick up and play. It's so cool, man! Yeah. So, awesome. Wow, I I love the yeah instruments and gear and stuff. That I, we kind of end up trying to cover gear and we've covered a lot of it quick. But is there anything like that revelations you've had recently? Uh, mm. Figuring out you know your rig. Was there time to play with your rig in quarantine? And get it? Yeah, a lot. I'm no. trying. I'm getting away from. Um, I got really into the quilter thing. Yeah. A couple of years ago. And yep. I still love it. It's like, that's the future. And I'm happy to use that all the time. Unless I'm playing like a huge 
show where I want to bring out the Macintosh and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a bunch of that kind of gear. I've got like three or four of those Macintosh rigs, but the quilter has been my thing lately. Um, but I noticed that I play the quilter with the gain pretty high because okay. I like that, like sort of natural compression and saturation yeah. and squish. I that don't can happen I with the... a compressor. Yeah. What were you going to yep. say? Oh, no, I was going to say the kind of the squash that happens with like a, a driven Macintosh. Yeah, exactly. You kind of get it when you crank the gain on a quilter. They do an amazing thing, but um, it like it messes with your pedals and, and some parts of your tones so much, you know, like it sounds Ice picky at times. Yeah, it sounds so nice on like the high notes and when you're taking like a like a really pretty solo high up on the guitar. But then you go to play like a like a China cat or something and you'll hear like yep. And those will be like, grant, grant, grant. you're like, oh, that's like distorted. You it's know? it's a pl- pl- pluppy or something. I don't know what the yeah, sound is. Yeah, totally. And so I noticed a lot in like um, in my envelope filters too, which I like. You know, it's you can get really close with a lot of them. All the old Mutrons are hand wired, and so this is why Jerry was playing every single one. But are you a micro? You're not a Microtron three or four person. No. Okay, doesn't do it for you. No, I've got a couple of them. They don't quite do it for me. Nothing quite does it for me like an old Mutron. Uh, and even a lot of those are like a blat, 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 like splat, whap, whap, whap. Yeah. Um, and you're looking, I'm looking for like a wow. Wow. You know? That's exactly the sound. Yep. Wow. And a lot of them are like whap, whap, whap. And I don't want that. Interesting. That's the, uh, an oversimplified version of my experience with the Qtron. Like I, yeah. the first envelope filter I had was a Qtron. I don't know if it was the pl- just the normal little box and, um, I think it's Electro Harmonics who makes it. And- yeah, but the se- the second best envelope filter I've ever found to an to a Mutron is the first Qtron, which is the big one. The big box, dude. Those sound good. The big one that with like the purple and the green font. On yep. Them. I had a, a bass playing friend in uh, in North Carolina had one of those, and I was like, damn. I was surprised that it wasn't ever in the dead signal chain because it I sounded know. so Grateful Dead. Well, so Mike Beagle, who designed the original Mutron, yep, worked with. Uh, so they then they came out with the HAZ Mutrons. Yeah, the yeah, nobody which are like two hundred and fifty right? bucks or whatever. And all yeah. those they just got the rights to the shell. Okay. So like the guts have nothing to do with a Mutron. They just look just like a Mutron. Gotcha. Um, okay. And the first thing that Mike Beagle did after the original Mutron was the first Electroharmonics Qtron. Cool. Which so, was the big box. Which was the big box. And now they've done the Qtron, the Qtron, the, the new generation Qtron, the Qtron Plus, the Micro know, Qtron, yeah, the Mini yeah, yeah. Qtron. Um, micro was the one I had, I think. And that those are awful. Yeah. It sounded like a, just a like a slapping a piece of paper. Yeah, flap, 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 flap. And yeah, so flap. those, uh, they, they were lucky enough to get Mike Beagle on the first run, which sound really good. They sort of sound like a Mutron. Yeah. Um, and then they ran with it and designing all these other ones, but they didn't have Mike. And so they were just sort of doing their own thing. And so now they had like people, they caught the listener's ear and people were like, Oh, the Qtron is cool. Then they came out with these five other Qtrons that were nothing to do with it. And people were like, what's going on? And everybody's already on the Qtron train. So it's hard to get off. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so then, uh, what was it? It was, um, it's Mutron now, but what uh, it was Mu, oh, it's Mu FX. Mu FX and uh, and yeah, they they came out with the um. And I th- I want to I can't remember if Mike is involved at all, but I know that he got like they got the uh, yeah yeah he's involved. He and Rand Anderson um, okay, yeah. are doing all yep. that stuff, and so like the Trutron was yep. really 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 good. Not yeah, quite a Mutron for me. I've got a couple of those, and they're Whoa. cool. It's also crazy what happened with the price of these. If you're looking for a true Dude, now, like a you can pay like bucks. Yeah, I see them for like fourteen or seventeen hundred, and you can just like just buy a Mutron. Get an original for, Mew what? for twelve, right? Like eleven, twelve. I haven't gone that far into it. I the pedal Dangerous. world is really cool, but I've just like I've I've not obsessed with the the Jerry pedals and dead pedal world as much as I have the amp side of things. It's dangerous. Honestly, we should do a whole another episode on just gear. I, that would be awesome, dude. I would love to do it. This has been a blast of an episode. I don't even know what we're at right now, but Yeah, where are we? Yeah, like a little yeah, an hour 18. This is a pretty good uh cool. Pretty good time, dude. We're going to have to <laughs> talk <laughs> talk more on like a, a honed in subject sometime i'm down to circle back and do especially with winter coming man for both of us we should Dude, do a, just I'm a gonna be talk. bored and chilling so yeah absolutely and uh yeah man i would love to 
we've done a couple live streams with the full band or been doing them throughout quarantine. So if you need any, you know, like run throughs on, awesome. <laughs> on live band Thanks, stuff, dude. I'm sure you got it covered, but we, uh, we did quite a few experiments trying to get it out on Facebook and oh, make it awesome. work properly. So, well, thanks man. Oh, dude, this has been uh, an unreal conversation. I'm so glad. You know, it's nice. I'm a little starstruck, and I'm, I'm happy that we were <laughs> able to, to get into the weeds and, and talk about things. It's yeah, very informative too, and you never would have it. guessed that I, I would learn so much. So. Oh, right on. I'm so glad, dude. Oh, this is awesome. Um, so where can, we, where can we find you for the next six months? Where yeah, sure. Everything I'm doing is on ZachNugent.com. Perfect. Uh, but please go check out my Twitch channel which is twitch.tv slash Zach Nugent Music. All righty. Um, and if you just look me up on Facebook, that's, that's like, it's like my website, but it's even more real time. I up that, update that daily, at least daily. Uh, Perfect. Try to keep that current. So just Zach Nugent Music on Facebook too. I'll put all those links in, uh, in our little description or It'd bar. Be great. Or yeah, and Patreon, Instagram, I'll get you all those. Yep. Awesome, man. Well, Zach, incredible. I uh, would love to have you back on if you're ever down to come back on. Let's and talk do it. To you. I'm down. Awesome, dude. That's it's so fun. And uh, maybe we'll get uh, you and Daniel and, and everybody together. We'll do a little panel or we something. We should do that. That'd be too. fantastic. I think it would be a blast to hear from from both sides of a, a guitar performing duo. So Let's do it, awesome. man. Dude, cheers. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. Yeah, that's it. That's Zach Nugent, everybody. Here we go. Cheers. See you next time.